welcome you to this very important conversation on COVID-19, on the vaccine, and what to do if you were to get COVID. We have an esteem ex ex panelist joining us for this evening's conversation. But before we, be we begin the conversation, I'd like to introduce our county executive, Laura Curran, to say a few, a few words to start the conversation. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, I'll be very short because we've got a wonderful panel. We've got great doctors and I know that you wanna hear from them. I'll just say very briefly, I wanna thank Dr. Andrea Altbrutus, who was our director of health equity, as she said, and Lionel Chitty, executive director of our Office of Minority Affairs for hosting this really important conversation. There are so many questions that people have about the vaccine. Is it safe? Is it affected? effective? Why, how was it produced so quickly? Can we trust it? Um, and obviously we're seeing and reading about hesitancy in the minority community. And we want to unpack that, dig into that. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from Dr. Reed and Dr. Phillips and answer, hopefully answer all of your questions. I just want to talk very briefly before I, I stop talking, uh, talking about the problem of supply and demand. We have hundreds of thousands of people in our county who are eligible for this vaccine and the eligibility continues to open up. Unfortunately, the supply chain has not opened up to the point where it's meeting that need, where it's meeting that demand. And we know how the supply chain works. It starts at the top with those pharmaceutical companies that are making it, that are producing it. Then it goes to the federal government and then the state government and then down to us on the local level, to our Department of Health, to our local hospitals, and now also to our local pharmacies. We're looking forward to the day when your doctor, your family doctor will have supply, will have doses to give to you and your family if you want it and when you're eligible. So there's many things to unpack here, but Andrea, I'm gonna kick it back over to you and I just wanna thank you, um, Dr. Reed and Dr. Phillips for, for joining us and thank you Lionel and Andrea for putting this together. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really appreciate you attending. Um, so we're gonna also turn to Lionel Chitty, who is the executive director for the Nassau County Office of Minority Affairs. Uh, Mr. Chitty, would you like to say a few words before we begin? Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you again, County Executive, for your time. Uh, we're more than ecstatic to be working uh, with the Office of Health Equity. Dr. Albrutus, we truly appreciate this. Uh, we, we, we will be continuing to partner with your department in order to bring the message out. Uh, we understand that, again, as the county executive said, there are a lot of questions, but we wanna make sure that we can address those questions in a nice format and get the people the information they need. We know that it's challenging, but we're working collaboratively to make sure that we can meet those needs. The entire team here at the Office of Minority Affairs is working diligently to go through these processes, to do outreach, to sit through the numerous Zoom meetings as far as collecting education and being able to share it with our constituency. Again, we do have a fantastic panel of medical experts and we truly appreciate uh, everybody taking the time this evening to listen to this important conversation. I'll turn Thank it you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chitty. And before we turn to our panelists, we also want to introduce uh, Dexter Hedgepeth, who is the program coordinator administration, strategy, and engagement for Nassau County Office of Minority Affairs. And he will be helping us with the Q&A portion of the webinar. Dexter, you wanna say a few words before we begin? Good evening and thank you for joining us. Please make sure that you like and share this video. Thank you. Thank you, Dexter, short and brief. And also I would like to say in addition to uh, Office of Minority Affairs sponsoring this event. We also want to mention that the Author T. Risbrook Medical Society of the Long Island affiliate of the National Medical Association is also a co-sponsor of the event this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two panelists, Dr. Michelle Reed, who is a medical director of MS Family Medicine Healthcare PC, owner of Fit Doc. Total Wellness, LLC, and adjunct assistant professor at the Department of Family Medicine at NYU Long Island School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Reed. And we also have Dr. Jadeanne Phillips, associate professor of family population and preventative medicine at the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University and the associate dean for minority student affairs of the Renaissance School of Medicine at School, at, at School of Medicine at Stony Brook University. We, we welcome you both. 
um, we, we really are looking forward to hearing information about the vaccine and also what to do, what to do when you have COVID. And um, we'll begin with Dr. Reed. Um, Dr. Reed, we also know from reading in Newsday that you also are a COVID-19 survivor. So can you tell us a little, a little bit more about your experience with COVID-19 and what do you recommend to your own patients when they get COVID-19? What to do when they first get the diagnosis that they are positive? Okay, so thank you very much, Nassau County Executive, for being able to say yes to us for having this, because I think it's forums like this where we share the information that people need to hear, because for me, education is always key. So I just like to start with that. Now, what happening is now is that people are getting diagnosed, and sometimes there's still a little misconfusion, because a lot of times you are going to an app, you're getting a phone call, saying that you are positive, but people don't know what to do next. So the what to do next is to always circle back to your primary care doctor. If you do not have a primary care doctor, you can look and contact the insurance company to find a primary care doctor. So that's the first thing. Um, you should not show up at a doctor's office. You should not go to work. You should not be taking your child to school if anyone is positive in your household. As someone who tests positive, you need to isolate. And that means isolate in your house. Do not mix and mingle with everyone. If you do have to leave your room where you are, you need to put on your mask. And the only reason why I'm using such a firm tone is because I've been doing a lot of remote or telemedicine for my patients. And there are people who are just walking around not wearing masks. And they're saying like, well, when I went to urgent care, they told me I tested positive. They didn't tell me that I shouldn't show up at your office. And they didn't say anything about walking around my house. So put on the mask if you do have to leave. And if possible, it's better if somebody comes and brings the food to you and puts it outside your door. So that way they are not coming in direct contact with you. If possible, and we know it's not always possible in our communities, if you can have your own bathroom, but if you're not able to have your own bathroom, very important that you clean and disinfect your bathroom before and after you use it. And whoever else goes into that bathroom and that shares it with you, they need to be doing the same. And that's everything from the doorknobs to the faucets, to the toilet seat, to the handle for the toilet, everything needs to be cleaned and disinfected after each use. So those I think are two key things that we need to remember is to isolate. And the normal time that we tell you is anywhere from 10 to 14 days, because during that initial period of being tested and finding out you're positive, you might not have any symptoms. And then sometimes symptoms will happen maybe a day or two after you find out that you've been tested positive. So really that 10 to 14 day period is the time where you need to isolate and stay where you are. Great information. Thank you so much for sharing the information. And can you tell us a little bit more about your own personal experience with COVID-19? Um, as a doctor, I'm guessing you didn't have to go to another physician to, to if things got more severe for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, you know, that could be like a seminar one, two, and three. I just know, I know. Now. So that's a loaded question. But will I, I will say is that I do have my own doctor, but basically I sort of took things into my own hands because as a physician, we do have knowledge. I knew what I had before I even was tested um, because one of the things that I started experiencing was my heart started beating quickly. Oh, wow. and my heart normally does not go fast, especially as a marathoner. And that was the first sign for me that, you know what, let me go get tested, take it from there. So everything else sort of happened after that, but I had already started to isolate myself after I was tested. Nobody else was in the car. And that's key to remember that if you go to get tested, do not put other people in the car with you, especially if you're going to a drive-through and even take your kids with you to get tested unless they are being tested and unless you feel that they might've been exposed to you. So what I did was I did the isolation um, fortunately, my husband and my children, they were able to use the bathrooms downstairs. I had my own bathroom. They brought me food. Really, my husband brought me food. And it was very rare that he came into the room. If he did, he did have his mask on. So those are key things that if somebody else does come in contact with you, they should be wearing their mask too. Because I mean, you know, we always forget. We always think about ourselves and sometimes we forget about other people. Yeah. So people who come in contact with the person who does test positive, 
wear the mask. Great, great information once again. And can you talk a little bit more about what to do, what symptoms should you, should you look out for if you become severe, if you have severe symptoms with COVID-19, when should you seek medical attention? Okay, well, what we're finding is since this is a novel disease, new, and it's caused by SARS-CoV-2, there are so many things that we are finding out day to day. So as far as symptoms, it could be something as simple as what we now call a COVID tongue, where the tongue becomes thickened, even has ulcers and change colors. Um, it could be rashes that we're seeing and even COVID toes, which become a little swollen and red sometimes. It could be a fever. It could be the, the palpitations of the heart because it affects your nervous system. So everything starts racing. It could be a headache. It could be a fever. Um, what we are, diarrhea for some people, nausea, vomiting. But when you start to have any type of problems where you cannot breathe, and I'm not talking about like, oh, you're out of shape, can't breathe, but you go and you start taking a few steps and you start sounding breathless and you're gasping for air or you're wheezing. Those are times when you need to go to the emergency room. And it's usually best not to call um, your neighbor to take you, but to call 911. Because when you are having problems struggling to breathe, you need to get checked out. And the lucky thing now as to what's going on as opposed to a year ago yeah. is that we're better prepared. So there are some hospitals in the area that they can go ahead and treat you there in the ER and send you home with follow-up, a pulmonologist that will do a telemedicine call with you, a pulse ox machine. There is even one hospital that have a program where they will actually bring you oxygen to your house if you need wow. to do that, along with a doctor doing telemedicine. So it's a totally different situation right now. But if you start to have that problem breathing, straight to the hospital. One of the other things that we are seeing with COVID now is that there's an increased risk of clots and the clots can go to any part of your body. So in my patient population, we're seeing a lot more pulmonary embolism, which are in the lungs. And when that happens, you can have the chest pain, you can feel the fatigue. Um, patient the other day I was talking to was just having chest pain, wasn't having any problems um, walking or anything, and it was just straight up chest pain. We're even seeing strokes. So if you are talking to a family member and all of a sudden the speech starts to get a little slurred, they seemed a little disoriented, think about a stroke. Yeah. But I need to remind people that even if you are not having shortness of breath and you start to experience something that is totally different and you feel uncomfortable, we have to remember that heart attacks are still happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. So don't sit at home saying, well, you know what? It's not COVID. I'm okay. No, we do not need you to stay home and have a heart attack. You need to go to the hospital. So do not neglect going to the ER if you know something is not right for the fear of being exposed to someone who has COVID. Exactly. And Dr. Phillips, I know that you also work with patients, some of whom may, do, may get COVID, and I also know you're doing a lot of webinars on this topic. Is there anything you want to add about what patients should do if they test positive for COVID? Well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this very important issue with uh, the esteemed panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reed, for the presentation. Thank you, fellow Baldwin resident, you know, for your presence and support in this issue. I think Dr. Reed gave tremendous information thus far. I think to add on to it, she made the point of making your doctor aware that you may have a concern or have tested positive. Now, why is that also important? Because in addition to the hospitals being more prepared on being able to treat COVID, there's some um, symptomatic treatments that are available to you as an outpatient. And if you are not plugged in with your doctor, and what I'm speaking of is monoclonal antibodies. In addition, convalescent plasma is another potential option. These are symptomatic medications that can help because again, when do people die from COVID? When they get serious disease. Going into the hospital is beginning that phase. I have, I'm from Queens, New York, 11369. In addition, for the Shea Stadium being in our zip code and for our hip hop, you know, historians, kid and play, we also were unfortunately the epicenter of the virus and the pandemic 
in March and April. So on top of work, which again is outpatient and inpatient care of patients dealing with COVID during this pandemic, because I'm that trusted face and that son of East Elmhurst, I probably had at least 10 patients nightly that were on my virtual rounding list. And a lot of them, unfortunately, did not have the access to having a primary care physician that they could call. Uh, again, the hospitals were sending you away. So again, there was a lot of confusion in the methodology, especially early on. And again, as people of color, we are persons that are about struggle and the ability to persevere. And I don't even think that's something unique to black people. Everybody, if it doesn't kill me and I can go to work, that means I'm all right. Unfortunately, the longer this virus can linger in you and cause problems, the more difficult it is to get out of it. So again, these symptomatic medications have been found to be very, very helpful. I think again, another issue, as Dr. Reed mentioned earlier about, you know, when you get notified, you know, I think the important thing, as I've said the whole time, if you think you have COVID, then act like you have COVID. Don't be that person, you know, I'm sure we've all seen the zombie movie and the person gets bit and they cover it up because they don't think the bite was deep enough. And then when we're trying to escape at the end, this person is about to change into the zombie. Again, what can happen with COVID is you can spread it. And sometimes, oh, it's just my allergies. That's why this year, even though I'm a person that tries to deal with my seasonal allergies, you know, with uh, more uh, natural remedies, vitamin C, things like that, I took my nasal spray this year because if I was on at Bank of America on Grand Avenue, I, they would look at me funny if I started sneezing behind them. So I think it's important if you have conditions that can be mistaken for COVID that you stay on top of them. In addition to that, as I was saying, if you think you've been exposed, um, again, what is an exposure? 15 minutes within six feet. So that means if we took a ride in my car from here to Mineola, that is more than 15 minutes. And if I called you the next day and said, I'm positive, then you should start, as Dr. Reed mentioned earlier, taking those steps to prevent, protect yourself and also to protect your family. So again, you know, I think again, activating your doctor or medical care and also in Suffolk County, there's some free resources to plug you in with the monoclonal antibodies. So those are things that you might wanna plug into if you are a person that's 65 or over. Cause again, there's criteria to qualify for these treatments and these treatments sort of typify the whole approach with COVID as far as how we're trying to manage it, which is directing resources to those that have been most affected and are most vulnerable. So again, number one, you need to have a positive test. So with the testing available now, take advantage of it because you can't get monoclonal antibodies if you don't have a documented positive test. As I said, a person over the age of 65, but you can be 55 and over with a history of heart disease, uh, diabetes, stroke, chronic kidney disease, and any type of immunosuppressive disorder like lupus or a cancerous condition. So again, if you're a person and you found out that you've been diagnosed with COVID and you fall into those categories, you need to contact your doctor. If you're starting not to feel well, because again, as Dr. Reed eloquently said earlier, there's some things that you have to monitor because again, things can go south with COVID very fast. So if you start noticing a change, now again, some of the tools that are available now with, you know, testing and being able to be, you know, as she put it earlier, able to monitor this at home, pulse oximeters are more commonplace in everyone's home. So again, if you get a pulse ox number less than 93%, you should start thinking about contact and medical care because things can go Fast, south fast very quick, quickly. In addition to that, don't make it about just a number. If you are perceiving that your breathing is changing in a rapid fashion, you need to start pursuing more emergent care. Because again, I think this disease has been so interesting in the sense that it is opening up so many of our weaknesses. One of our weaknesses, which is a strength, as I said, people don't like to let little things stop them. 
But unfortunately, this is a little thing that can quickly become a big thing. And then 2020 or 2021 becomes a year where something that wasn't supposed to happen happens. Yeah. Great information. And thank you for sharing the resources at Stony Brook. And I know, Dr. Reed, that you also had some other um, resources that you wanted to share, including two programs at Northwell, I think the Crown Program and the uh, COVID Ambul Ambulatory Resource Support Cares Program. Would you like to talk about those two programs and any other programs you'd like to, to share? So both of those programs, and, and a lot of this is just information that we get because sometimes like we get inundated with emails and we're not able to follow up with everything in a timely fashion because we are busy taking care of patients right now. But I actually this week did refer someone to the CARES program at Northwell and same day within I think an hour's time, they were able to get plugged in, had a telemedicine visit with a primary care doctor who followed it up with a pulmonologist they brought the person a pulse ox, they gave them oxygen, and they're basically having a nurse follow up with them in person every day to make sure everything is fine. So that way you're given the services that you need. And if the person needed to go to the hospital, the nurse is assessing them and they will refer them straight to the hospital. So these are things that are out there that we need to make sure that we take advantage of. Um, some of the other local hospitals have similar programs, but that is one that personally I've had experience dealing with with my patients. Um, and I also heard that like St. Francis Hospital, you can go there without an appointment, have a COVID test done. They do the rapid, they do the PCR. And even if you need antibody testing, they will do it without an appointment. I haven't tried it myself, but that's what I've been told by different patients. So it's the resources are out there. You just have to make sure you get in contact with your primary care doctor who can help to facilitate whatever your needs are. Great, thank you for the information. Also, I wanna share that we're still doing COVID testing with our partners at the Long Island FQHCs. And just wanna give that phone number for those who want to get free COVID testing. Um, they provide COVID testing Monday through Thursday and every other Saturday. And that phone number is 516-396-7500. Again, that's 516-396-7500. Um, so thank you for the information about COVID so, testing. And we, oh, Dr. Phillips, go ahead. I, I wanted to add one additional program that I became aware of is with transportation assistance, which I think can also be very mm -hmm. critical. Uh, yeah. Northwell is providing health solutions, one word at northwell.edu. And it is a transportation assistance program that can accommodate whatever your financial difficulty may be in order to get you to these appointments so you can follow through with the care. So again, yet another resource that's available to the community to help with this problem. Perfect. And I was gonna say, no, Andrea, you're gonna post everything um, with the site later on, but could you also post it um, or put it into the chat or maybe Dexter could put these things that we're saying into the chat too. Um, yes. even with New York City, New York City does offer free housing if you do test positive and you do not have, you know, capability of isolating in your own home because you might have other people, because that's what we find, especially with the population that we do care for, is that a lot of them are essential workers and they do not necessarily have the space where they can isolate and stay by themselves. So this is a really good program that they have with New York City. That's great, yes. Um, that's if there's any chance you could add any other information in the chat, that would be great. But also, I just want to mention that we're going to be, we are recording this video, and a recording of this video will be available on the county website, I believe, as of tomorrow. And when we post the video, we'll add additional, all the resources that we mentioned in tonight's call. Um, I want to turn our attention to the vaccine now, because as many of you know, even though there is a high demand for the vaccine, a lot of people within communities of color are hesitant to take the vaccine. So I wanna to shift to Dr. Phillips and talk a little bit about the vaccine, how it was developed, the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. And also we could dive into why people are hesitant to take the vaccine. Well, I'm gonna start with that part first, because I think, again, sometimes the error that we make as a profession is we try to go right to the vaccination part. And I think, again, just like you would have in a relationship, if you've done something that may have offended another person, 
it's hard for them to listen to you until you say sorry or acknowledge that you've done something wrong. And I think, unfortunately, you know, this uh, pandemic has exposed communities of color having less than adequate resources and other contributing factors that have led to high health comorbidities and high um, mortality from this pandemic. And I think, again, you know, the other thing is if, like, if you have a friend who constantly tells stories that the two of you are involved in, always highlighting themselves as great and highlighting you in a negative way. You don't wanna hear anything from that person. And I think this is where we've got to unpack as uh, Representative Cohen mentioned earlier, we've got to unpack because again, people, I have a, a, a relative. My relative is a OBGYN doctor very good doc, great doctor. And when I talked to her about getting the vaccine, she expressed distrust. Now I know this person is part of administering board exams, which requires a high level of academic performance. And to hear that person express that, I knew she understood the technology. Again, you know, this mRNA technology is not new. Um, it's been something that's been used previously with other viruses like the flu and the Zika virus and also rabies treatment. In addition to that, it's also been used with treatments of cancer, such as skin cancers like melanoma. But she expressed, back to the, my, my relative, she expressed distrust in the person giving the, the treatment. And I think, again, if we don't start to address that. Unfortunately, you've got a lot of people that are stubborn, that would cut their nose off to spite their face. And, you know, again, that's why I think it's great that you're doing this right here. Because again, when the messenger, I could probably walk around the corner to Representative Executive Kern's house and talk a medical, you know, symphony as far as good information but because they don't know me and they know her, they're gonna trust her naturally. It has nothing to do, she could be saying the completely wrong thing. And I think again, you know, we've gotta look at that, especially as we look at this vaccine rollout. This vaccine rollout, unfortunately, initially came with, we're gonna bring it here and we're just gonna assume just cause we got the hottest thing item in town that everybody's gonna to come to it. We don't work that way. You know, so again, unfortunately, we've got to, as I said, own up to some of the previous issues before we can even talk about the vaccine. And I think that comes, again, I understand the time clock of the pandemic as far as people are dying, but it comes with activities like this. When you have community messaging, it's done with persons that the community, community may be familiar with. It's also connected to entities that are known within that community for providing work or quality work. Now, again, the other part of it is understanding that all of us don't have this access to technology. Either it's intellectually, we might not be capable of it. And from what I've understood, the navigation of the state website has not been the easiest. And for people that may only check, you know, tolerate one mistake or one time being pushed out of the queue, they're gonna say, you know what, I'm not messing with this. But unfortunately, another thing that's happened is you have what they refer to as vaccine tourists. Mm -hmm. And these vaccine tourists are people that are a little more savvy and aggressive and they will travel. And unfortunately, these vaccine tourists have sort of continued the disparity appearance that we've had throughout this pandemic. You look at the amount of people of color getting vaccinated to the amount of individuals that are Caucasian. In, the, in Long Island, I think we might have a four times difference in uh, black and brown people with respect to our Caucasian counterparts out here. And again, I see with my own patients that there's a willingness to travel anywhere. So again, some of these logistical things that may be a problem for underserved communities are not necessarily a problem. And I'm not saying everybody that's pursuing getting a vaccine 
is doing it with, in, you know, insincere intentions. But I'm just saying that this is exposing some of the inequities that we have had historically. You look at some states that have put out the vaccine sites or distribution. These distribution areas, for the most part, in, in white communities. And it's not because they don't want to put them in black communities, but a lot of times we don't have the space resource in our communities to entertain activities like this. So already we're operating from a deficit. So again, you got people that don't trust, you got communities that don't necessarily have the resources to have these type of ongoing efforts. And unfortunately, you've got the additional piece of misinformation. Mm -hmm. And the misinformation, I mean, again, we all probably, you know, get our full share of social media. But social media was like, if I, when I was living in Queens, you got the, you come out the bodega and you got the guy right there. And he's like, come in for a second. Hey, two plus two equals eight. And now people are running with that. Did you know that two plus two equals eight? And you might be a mathematician. And because of this challenge to truth, people still will fight you up and down. I mean, I had a very passionate disagreement with one of my friends in a Zoom call. And again, I had to say I loved him afterwards because I didn't agree with his thought process of why he would not take the vaccine. And he had a very close relative that, again, we're talking not in March or April, we're talking December that just died from COVID. And this guy wasn't out here doing the wrong thing. But again, when we start talking about things like it being more infectious with these new variants, you know, again, that adds some additional, you know, unreadiness to this already crazy situation. So again, I think those are issues that we really, as we roll out the messaging, as we roll out going into these communities and again, targeting the vulnerable and underserved, we have to take and accept whatever deficits they may be that aren't necessarily the fault of the people we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. Kind of executive, you have a question. Yeah, I just want to jump in. This is fascinating. Um, trusted messengers and trusted places to get the vaccine are incredibly important to encourage people to come and get it. And we're partnering with the FQHCs that we partnered with for testing. And these are in Elmont, Freeport, Westbury, Roosevelt, um, El Hempstead. By Elmont, Hempstead, yes, yes. I knew I was forgetting one, Hempstead. And we saw, those were the communities that were hard hit. When we started testing there, we saw the rates actually go down in those communities because people were using the testing. Now we're going to be partnering with them again for vaccine distribution for those with comorbidities. Now that that's a new eligibility, we're gonna be giving some of our Department of Health doses to the FQHCs. We're just working it all out now, but because it's in the community and it's already a trusted partner, I'm hoping that encourages people to come and get the vaccine. And thank you for sharing that information because breaking news, Dr. Reed, I'd like to add to that. Yeah, and I just wanted to just piggyback off what she said because the thing is when you can go someplace where you feel comfortable and you see people who look like you, mm -hmm. you are more likely to receive the vaccine. So even there was an article with the Family Practice Society, which I'm a member of, and it talked about how primary care doctors, we are the ones who are always doing vaccinations for our patients, and some of them from birth all the way to geriatrics. So our patients are looking at us, well, you know what, you don't have the vaccine, so maybe I shouldn't get the vaccine. And, and I'm walking around my hands tied saying, well, you know what, I applied to the state, I applied to the city, we're waiting for our supply to come in. But at least hopefully with it going to the federally under, under uh, qualified center, maybe eventually they'll trickle down into the private practice, which I think is key, or maybe the private practice can start to refer our patients to there. Because even though my offices are in Garden City and in Rosedale, Rosedale is right there, Southeast Queens, we were hit hard. Yep. And then the other site is is right there next to Hempstead and Uniondale, which were hit hard. So these are things that we really want to make sure that we are vocal about because we do care about our people. There's a reason why I started my practice 19 years ago. I want to serve people. I want to serve people who look like me, who feel comfortable with a doctor who looks like them, who can talk like them. But I also want to serve everybody. 
And I think that's what Dr. Phillips, you can hear his compassion, you can hear my compassion, is that is like one of the things that we really want to do because, you know, this is, this is a, what, Wednesday night. And, you know, most doctors, once they leave their office, they take their coats on. But here you have two that are right here from the area who have their coats on, who feel it's important that we educate our people. So we're going to circle back to Dr. Phillips and you are going to explain the vaccine to us because people are in the chat. They want to know about this vaccine, this MRA vaccine. So let's get going with this. Yes. Can you? Go a little bit more into what is. Oh, no, no, MRA. I was, but again, as I said, we can't speed up, you yes. know, the process. So again, if you want them to hear about the vaccine and you don't acknowledge that you understand why they may not listen to Laura Kern and they may listen to Dr. Janan Phillips, then we're not going to be successful. So again, that's why I went into that first. But again, the mRNA vaccine, mRNA technology, as I mentioned earlier, is not new. What the mRNA vaccine does is it is a chemical sequence that can be developed in a laboratory, which again is a newer technology as far as speed, because one of the benefits of it initially was if we ever had a pandemic, this would be the technology that would enable us for rapid production of large quantities of vaccine. What the vaccine does is it in your body, it allows your cell to create a replica of the spike protein. With the spike protein, again, everybody's seen some caricature of the COVID virus with the horns on it. And how the COVID virus causes a problem is that those horns, which are referred to as the spike protein, attach to your cell. Once it attaches to your cell, the virus is able to enter your cell again as Dr. Reed mentioned earlier, it can affect anywhere in the body. And the reason for that is the virus can affect the endothelial cells, which are the cells that line the blood vessels and we have blood vessels throughout our body. So again, if you are able to prevent that contact point, then you are rendering essentially the virus inert or incapable of causing serious disease. So again, once you've received the first shot, which is your primer, your immune system starts to produce this replica or your your cell produces this replica of the spike protein. And then your immune system will produce antibodies. Those antibodies will start to generate a memory so that if you're exposed to it, then you're able to have an immune reaction. To get to that point where you're able to have that type of strong immune reaction, you require a booster shot. For the Pfizer, it's a 21 day interval between the first and second shot. For the Moderna, it's a 28 day interval. So again, after the second shot, you are, you pro- they say probably two to three weeks after that, you should have full immunity against the, you know, the virus. So with that being said, you know, there are questions that People ask about it, wow, this took so fast. How did they do this? Again, the technology is a lot different. The first thing I'd say is this, if I invited all of y'all over to listen to music in 2021 and I put an eight track in, you would look at me like everybody is smiling right now. And I think sometimes that's how we look at this vaccine technology. The flu shot that we get every year, that technology is from like the 70s. So again, you know, why do we, are we against that there's some modernization going on? The mRNA vaccine, the way it's produced, you can send, I could send Dr. Reed's laboratory, the chemical formula for the mRNA and in her lab, she could produce it chemically and have vaccine ready in about a week. Now, the ways that we used to do it, it could take months to a year. So you are able to make that process much more effective. Again, because Pfizer and Moderna, probably Pfizer because they were the first, Pfizer is one of the largest companies in the pharmaceutical business. And they felt so good about their animal studies that they said, hey, we're gonna roll the dice and we're gonna produce enough vaccine to do all phases of our human trials simultaneously. So by doing that now, normally, You have phase one, phase two, phase three. They differ by the size of the group 
And those phases can take a year, two years to finish. They did it all simultaneously, understanding that if anything goes wrong, they're going to throw it away. Now, who can do stuff like that? Those are individuals that can afford to take that loss. And I think Pfizer leveraged their large place in that market in taking that chance. But as we say in Queens, scared money don't make money. So again, Pfizer in doing that and doing those trials simultaneously, again, consolidated the time. It did not mean that we skipped steps. Some people said, well, how did the UK get the vaccine before us? The United States has one of the most stringent FDA approval processes. And the reason they got it before we did in the UK is because they stepped, skipped some of the final steps. So again, it wasn't that steps were skipped, is that it, things were done much more efficiently. Understanding that this is a pandemic. I think that's another thing that people got to look at. People are trying to apply normal logic and thought process to a very abnormal circumstance. So again, people say, well, if, if I get it, am I going to have to get the vaccine again? We already get the flu shot regularly. So we that is not a foreign idea to us. So if we had to, again, I'm okay with that. Um, but what they're saying potentially, maybe two years, maybe three years, maybe every five years, you get the flu shot every year. If you get the pneumonia vaccine, it may be a five year difference between shots. So again, having a, a follow-up vaccination is not a new circumstance to us. Another thing people ask is, well, I heard that, you know, if you have allergies, you can die from it. I heard somebody got Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy can happen with any vaccine. So if I saw four cases of Bell's palsy out of a million, I am not blaming COVID-19 vaccine on that. That can be just a routine, normal side effect that you can see. Some people said, well, what about those individuals that died from it? God bless Hammer and Hank. Hammer and Hank was a hero of mine growing up. But I tell you this, as a doctor, and I'm sure Dr. Reed can attest, we have trained eyes. So when I saw the picture of Hammer and Hank Heron getting his COVID vaccination, I looked down in the wheelchair and noticed that his legs were three to four times the size of normal, which said to me, Hammer and Hank ain't in good health. So again, you know, that was a situation that was big on social media. I had a friend who was part of a thread who was also a doctor, and he said, well, Hammer and Hank died from after the vaccine. I don't know if I'm getting it. And I had to hold them accountable with the same passion that you guys are seeing and telling them that we have a responsibility to circle back and give that the autopsy showed that he died of natural causes. Mm -hmm. So again, you look at some of these circumstances and said, well, what about that nurse that got the shot and then he got COVID right after it? As Dr. Reed said earlier, it can take two to 14 days to develop COVID. They do not require a COVID test to get vaccinated. They just require you not showing symptoms. So if you got your vaccine two days after being exposed and you didn't have symptoms, you could theoretically develop symptoms right after that and have COVID while being vaccinated. Does not mean that the vaccine didn't work. It just means that this is how serious COVID is. Another story you heard, well, how could, some, why, why do I need to wear a mask if I'm vaccinated? Yes, we would all like to be like Hank the Tank in old school and just take it and just run around. That's what we would love to do. But unfortunately, as it was said earlier, the vaccine prevents serious disease. Mm -hmm. You could still theoretically get infected by COVID, so therefore, if you're around someone who is not COVID or not vaccinated, you could expose them to COVID. Yeah. So again, that's why until we even get to that level of herd immunity, the whole conversation of abandoning safety precautions is not good. We have to stay on top of continuing to utilize these safety measures because they are critical even if you are vaccinated. You know what? And I'm going to take it a step further. Okay. So I personally, I finished my vaccine. 
So I, right now in another week or two, I will be fully vaccinated. And I should, and I'm praying that I do have that 95% being effective. My parents will receive their second dose on Friday. All because in another two weeks from that time, I'm not gonna show up their house without my mask and expect for them to be in their 80s, not without mask. Everybody's gonna have on mask because you have to remember that nothing is 100%. And even if I have had my vaccine and you said it, and I'm just gonna reiterate it, is that I could still be exposed to it. Yeah. I could still have it in my nasal passage. Mm -hmm. I can pass it to somebody else and be asymptomatic. So that's something we still have to remember because maybe my parents might be that percentage where they are not fully immune. So please keep in mind that the information that we're saying, we're not just saying it, this is proven proven facts about what's going on. And I think one of the other things that I want to make people clear of is that not everybody does have internet access to go online and have the patients, like Dr. Phillips said, to make their appointment. But I do know of a few people that patiently sat and they kept calling and calling and calling and were able to make not one, but two appointments using the phone system. So hopefully as we start to see this 5% increase of the vaccines that are coming into our state, that that will hopefully help to free up some more slots and give us the appointment availabilities that we need, especially since the governor said that they're gonna be setting up two other sites that he said would be able to do 3000 vaccines a day that are open only to Queens residents and that'll be at York College, and the other one in Brooklyn will be at Medgar Evers, and they're going to be run by the federal government. So our increase does not include those. So I just want to make sure that people are clear. I see from the chat that we have people from Ohio, New Jersey that are on. So it's about checking to see what's going on in your state. That is key. Um, I do have a link that I can post later on, and I'll post it to um, once this goes live and also to my page so people can find out what to do from their states from A to Z, all the states are listed. And at least that is something that you can really go through because it's key that we go to where the information is true because everything on social media right. is not true. So right. find dependable sources. I completely agree with that. Find dependable, credible sources. I know we have a lot of questions that our audience are asking. So I want to allow some time for Q&A. Dexter, do you want to um, give us some questions for our panelists? Yes, absolutely. First, I want to once again thank our panelists and the county executive for this opportunity. Um, our uh, Facebook Live page is absolutely blowing up. This um, has been a night of good information and conversation. Um, and so I want to thank everybody for watching. Once again, if you are watching this, please like and share. Please follow the Office of Minority Affairs Facebook page, the County Executive Facebook page. We always are releasing updated information. Also, many of you have said um, we didn't have an opportunity to uh, know about this earlier. Please inbox us your email address. We want to put you on our mailing list so that you do not miss another Facebook Live. Once again, all you have to do is inbox us your email address. We will put this on um, our Facebook. It will stay up here. We also will e-blast it out to you tomorrow with a thank you letter, the hyperlink. It will be posted to our county executive YouTube page. And so we want this information to get out there. As Dr. Reed has said, we have people from all over watching Nassau County. And so we are grateful. Some of the questions that have come up um, Dr. Phillips have addressed the importance of the vaccine. Another question that is so important that many people have asked is explain to us this Johnson and Johnson vaccine. A lot of people are hearing about the Johnson and Jackson vaccine. Some are saying that there was issues with the powder that they had put out prior to and they want to know is they're going to have the same issue with this vaccine um, as it relates to the Johnson and Johnson um, and it's just so much information. The county executive, they would like for you to uh, go back and once again and reiterate uh, what is taking place as far as in Nassau County. 
uh, with the vaccines and the locations. Um, some people are just joining in, but they are so engaged and we wanna make sure that we address some of those questions. So I would say Johnson & Johnson question, um, at this time or feedback at this time, as well as the locations and the recap information. Our county executive have explained it thoroughly at the beginning of this session, and I'm sure she would be more than delighted to come back and share that information with you again. Thank you for this time. Great. So Dr. Phillips, do you want to talk about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is not out there. Not so yet. So again, y'all, yeah. you know, I know everybody wants to, you know, they may like Johnson & Johnson, but the thing that I tell everyone is when you try to go for Mo and you got show, you end up with no, which means if you try to go for more and you already got a shot with Pfizer or Moderna, don't jump out of line. You know, as a person who partied in New York growing up, I used to go to the Paradise Garage. I remember the weekend it was closing and one of my friends who came up, I went to Johns Hopkins, we would go to the club and he would always want to leave the line and go to his car or something like that. And then he'd come back and try to jump back in line in a New York club line, that's not happening. That, yes. So what I'm saying to y'all, if y'all going to jump out of line, you may not be able to get back into your spot. And with that being said, these COVID bullets are coming closer and closer each day. I mean, unfortunately, salute to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but that is going to be the way that the UK variant is going to get to our country because of its more infectious nature. And events like that where people are just screaming, celebrating, that is going to be a super spreader event. So with things like that happening, I wouldn't be waiting on Johnson & Johnson. If Moderna called me and said, hey, we got a shot for you tomorrow, guess what? I'm going to go get Moderna. I personally got the Pfizer shot. The reason I got the Pfizer shot is because I work at a large institution which has the requirements of refrigeration that are needed for the, uh, Pfizer, which is negative 80 to negative 120 degrees centigrade. The Moderna is able to be refrigerated at levels more seen in your pharmacies or other smaller venues. And that's why it's more widespread because I have my friends who are like, yo, I want to get the Pfizer like you got. I don't mess with that Moderna. And I'm like, look, I would take either one. If whichever one that was provided to me, I would take it. The one that I'm not going to worry about is the one that's not on the table right now. And again, I'm not minimizing Johnson & Johnson. I'm just saying we need to position ourselves at whatever door Moderna or Pfizer is going to be available for. Now, another thing to think about is maybe participate in a vaccine trial. I know I have family members that participated in the Novavax trial at Stony Brook. Again, you know, these are other options. And as we get further along in this, hopefully Johnson Johnson will be available. Hopefully Novavax. I think with that, then we have the ability to spread and give more communities or more of our general population or more areas that don't have the facilities to have some of the storage capabilities that are needed with, say, the Pfizer. So again, Johnson & Johnson actually is an adenovirus that has a modification to it chemically to mimic the spike protein. So that is what's used to trigger the immune response that starts an antibody production against, again, the spike protein. As you keep hearing me say spike protein, that is the key part with the COVID virus is its ability to attach. If it doesn't attach, it doesn't cause all the drama that it's causing us right now. So again, these antibodies to the spike protein will prevent it from, again, causing serious disease. The data that's been shown thus far about J&J &J show about a 70, 72 percent, you know, success rate or efficacy in comparison to Pfizer, which is 90 percent, Moderna, which is 94.5. Now I know my folks, they're going to say, well, I don't want to take the 72 percent. I want the 90 percent one. I would take 70 or 90 or 94.5 percent as opposed to dealing with the risk of COVID. Mm -hmm. So whichever vaccine which has been appropriately vetted and approved that you become a, 
you know, a candidate for, I would say that's the one you need to really start thinking about. Unless you have, you know, stock options or something like that. Now I'm being funny. <laughs> And I was gonna say, and this is also a family thing. So this is where as a community, we have to pull together. So if you know a senior person who is not good with technology, please, there are some young teenagers that are out there that are looking to make some extra money between remote learning and not having some after school sports. They will be willing to sit on the computer to help somebody even if you give them volunteer hours, if you can't give them money. So we have to be resourceful of making sure it gets out there to people's arms who really need it. Because research has shown if anybody is not at a healthy way, is having any type of heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, immunocompromised, they are going to be at increased risk of having complications that could possibly lead to death. And one of the things that we did not talk about is the long-term effects, long haulers or what some people call long COVID. And COVID is affecting the entire body. So we're seeing patients that are having headache, dizziness, problems walking due to balance being off, ringing in their ears, now having to wear hearing aids because they can't hear, intermittent periods of blindness. Um, I myself, I now have asthma. I never had asthma. Mm -hmm. Nobody in my family has asthma. So we're seeing damage to people's lungs. So these are things that we need to really think about. So if somebody says, so what were the side effects from the vaccine? Well, guess what? I had a little headache, no fever. The second vaccine, my fingers were cold. My toes were cold. I felt a little achy. So the day number two, I took me some Tylenol and I was good as gold. Right. I'd rather go through that than all of the symptoms that I went through with COVID. So put things in perspective. Right now is almost a year ago. Think about where we were a year ago. Where do we see ourselves in a year from now? Even if we have to walk around with our mask, because you see, even though I'm in the house, guess what's in my pocket is my mask. So can't take any chances. So let's mask up. In some cases, double mask, especially if the mask is not tight but we have to be careful. We do, we do. And I know uh, Dr. Reed and uh, Connie said, Perry, you may be able to stay on for a few minutes, but I know that Dr. Phillips needs to go because he's doing another Zoom call this evening. But I just want to take this moment to thank Dr. Phillips for sharing all the compassionate and passionate information with our audience about the vaccine, about COVID, about everything. I think that one thing that we're really demonstrating with this Zoom call is that the messenger really helps. And I think you really spoke to our audience today. So thank you so much, Dr. Phillips. And hopefully we can have you again to answer a lot of the questions. I'm sure we won't be able to cover all the questions tonight, but hopefully down the road, we could do this again. So thank you, Dr. Phillips. And I know that uh, we have a few more questions. We won't stay too much past seven, uh, but thank you once again, Dr. Phillips. So we'll turn to, I think, uh, Dex, you had a question for the county executive, correct, about uh, the additional vaccine size, if you want, if she could reiterate information that was shared earlier on in the conversation. Sure, I'd be happy to give a rundown. So in Nassau County, about 150,000 vaccines have been administered. Of all of those, the County Department of Health has done about 21,000. So it's about one seventh of all vaccines have been done through our County Department of Health. The Nassau County Department of Health is currently running two sites. It's at the Community College, Nassau Community College, right in the heart of our county, and at Yes We Can Community Center in Westbury. Uh, today we announced we're doing a soft launch of a third site at LIU Post, and we're gonna be working with a nursing school. So nursing students and faculty and staff can help us administer the vaccine. So I'm very much looking forward to that. We're also now going to be partnering with the community clinics called FQHCs. They're going to be helping us handle the folks with comorbidities. And this is a new COVID word for me, comorbidities. So it's things like people who have heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, obesity, you know, underlying health conditions that can make them really at risk of dying from COVID. Uh, of course, the goal is to save as many lives as possible. So we're grateful for the partnership with the FQHCs in our communities. Um, we've made a commitment here at Nassau County in our Department of Health. Every single vaccine dose that we get in has gotten into somebody's arm. We've not thrown away one dose, and I'm really proud of the team at the Department of Health. We've got fabulous staff, fabulous volunteers who are working really hard to make sure that we're getting this done. 
Uh, we're also not making appointments for people unless we have the vaccine in hand, because if we know how hard it is to get that appointment, and the worst thing is, is when you finally get one that it has to be canceled because we don't have the vaccine. So we did have to cancel a couple of times because of the past two, I shouldn't say cancel, I should say postpone, because of the last two snowstorms that we had. But as of yesterday, every single one of those that was postponed was done. So we're back to, we're back to 100% in right. our record. And we'll continue that. Now, I couldn't agree more with Dr. Reed when she says it's so important for the access to open up, for your family doctor who you trust to have supply of this vaccine. We also know that, um, you know, you know, trust is incredibly important. We also know that people are now used, I'm used to getting my flu shot down on the Grand Avenue Walgreens. It's just a matter of course for me. People get their shingle shots there. Soon, more and more of those kinds of pharmacies will be coming online with the vaccine. You know, where, however we can get it to people, we're, you know, looking at mass vaccination sites as well. We know the state's running one down in Jones Beach and out at Stony Brook. The more ways that people can get it, the better it is. But every single problem, you know, everything, everything comes back to the initial problem that we don't have enough supply right now. So we're going to get more supply. We know that that's going to happen. Um, I'm going to get, I'm not eligible yet, but whenever I am, I'll get whatever I can. Um, Johnson and Johnson's appealing because it's one dose, unlike the Moderna and the Pfizer that are two dose, but whatever, I'll get what I can when I can. Uh, and, and then it, it, I think it is also really important to continue talking about vaccine hesitancy and the lack of trust and dispelling all of those rumors and misinformation. And Dr. Reed made a, a great point about side effects. You know, those side effects are really your immune, your immune, immune system responding to the vaccine and you weigh the benefit and the risks. To me, it's a no brainer, the benefit of not having those long-term possible problems with COVID, transmitting it to my loved ones, you know, that to me is such a risk that I don't want to take. I'm, you know, a few uh, side effects I'd be happy to, to suffer through. That's okay. me personally. Yeah. It's, and, and as Dr. Phillips said before, it's one thing for me to say it. It's one thing for people who look like the people who are getting the vaccine to say it. I think it carries more weight. I agree. I fully agree. Uh, that's the, I want to re uh, respect everyone's time. And I know we have a lot of questions. Perhaps we could take one or two more questions before we close. Absolutely. And we can kind of um, sum this up, uh, Dr. Reed. So um, there are three that I would like for you to address. One, people want to know the difference between the doses and the account. So why is there two doses? Why do we have to wait an extended period of time before we take the second dose. Um, they also- Wait, so I'll just answer that one quickly. So what, when they have the studies that are done, the studies looks at the time period. So during that time period, that's the time period that they figured out. So from 21 days to 28 days for the Pfizer, that is when your second dose should be. So that way your booster shot is a lot more effective during that time period. And then for the Moderna, 28 to 35 days. So that's the importance of doing a study. And I think Dr. Phillips brought up a key point. Many of us don't necessarily volunteer to be part of a trial. So by volunteering to be part of a trial, you are creating and rewriting our own history now. And you are turning the tide and you realize the importance of participating in a study that will help to advance not just a single race, but the entire world. Because we have never been in a situation where the entire world has been working at the same time to come up with a vaccine for a disease. Okay, and the last two question, one is, does the vaccine prevent getting COVID? And the second question would be, who should not take the vaccine? Okay, so I'm gonna do the second one first. So as far as who should not, right now Pfizer's vaccine is for 16 and older and Moderna is for 18 and older. So children or anyone under the age of 16 should not be getting the vaccine. If you suspect or your doctor suspects that you might have some type of allergic reaction to any of the components of a vaccine, then you need to check with your doctor to see what would be the proper protocol. So some doctors, especially allergists, they are having you have their immunization given right there in their office 
or they're arranging to be present or have an allergist on staff for when you get your vaccine. Because once you get the vaccine, the normal wait is like 15 minutes. But if they suspect that you might have an allergic reaction, they usually say, bring your EpiPen with you. Some doctors are saying pre-sedate with like maybe some Benadryl and bring your EpiPen and you're watched a little longer. Some people up until like an hour after they've had the second dose. And what was your other question? The second question was, does the vaccine prevent COVID? Some people who have taken the vaccine have gotten COVID after taking the vaccine. So people want to know the information regarding that. So we have to remember that both of them are 94 or percent effective. So if you want to say that Pfizer is 95% and Moderna is 94%, that means effective of presenting the disease. Doesn't mean that you can't get it, you can still get it. And that's why I said, make sure you still wear your mask because I can get it and pass it on to somebody else and I will not have any symptoms of it. So if I was to get sick, I would less likely to have any symptoms. Same thing as with the flu shot. So these variants shouldn't really scare people because guess what? There's a variant of the flu because viruses always mutate. And that's why if you remember a couple of years ago, flu vaccines did not work because they had picked the wrong one that they felt was going to be the flu of the year. So those are things to just really remember. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed, and thank you so much, Dexter, for sharing uh, the questions from the audience. And it's really great to know that the audience were super engaged into this in this conversation, and hopefully we're able to do this again in the near future. But I just want to take this moment to thank Dr. Reed, thank the County Executive, thank the Office of Minority Affairs, thank the National Medical Association for co-sponsoring this event. It has been really well received. I could tell from already from my text messages that I've been receiving that people are really enjoying this conversation. Um, I'm hoping that we do this again in the near future. We're hoping to do this type of conversation with our, with our, 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 our brothers and sisters at the Office of Hispanic Affairs and also with the Office of Asian Affairs. So we want to make sure we really get this word out to all people in communities of color who have been really impacted by COVID-19. Um, so we're going to end the conversation this evening, but this evening, but we'll keep the conversation going in the future. And I just want to uh, say to everyone to please continue to wash your hands, to wear your mask, to double mask when it's appropriate, uh, to continue to social distance and to continue to look out for each other. Um, because we'll, the way we'll get through this is by working together on solving this pandemic. So thank you once again for everyone for viewing this really special and important and passionate uh, talk that we had tonight about COVID-19. So thank you all for, for viewing and we hope to see you in the near future. Thank you. Yes, and thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity as always. Thank you, thank you. Have a good, and uh, tomorrow we'll be posting this video on the county's website with additional information on the links and resources to get a test or to get the vaccine and to get treatment for COVID-19. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.